Let's look at the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter number 8. 2 Chronicles chapter number 8. I want to read one verse. We're going to pray. And then I'm going to go back into... You can put your finger back in 1 Kings. Put your finger back in 1 Kings. Get my Bible all straight here. Put your finger back or a marker or a little ribbon or a chewing gum wrapper or something back in 1 Kings, okay? If you're there at 2 Chronicles chapter number 8, say amen. amen. Would you stand as we read this word, as we gather one last time this week, to reverence the holy word of God. Verse 11. And Solomon... Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David unto the house that he had built for her. For he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come. Let's pray just for a moment. Lord Jesus, uh, you know I need you. You know the arm of faith, uh, flesh would fail me. You know, God, that my intellect is not sufficient. You know that my words, Lord, would come up short. But, oh, God, I need you right now in this sacred place, in this scary place behind this pulpit before your sacred word. God, I pray once again, as I've prayed all through this time, that you would just fill me with your spirit. And God, give me unction to preach exactly what you want me to. And I trust, Lord, that the Word of God will do what only it can do. And that the Spirit of God will speak what only he can speak. And that Christians would be challenged and the wayward would be set straight. And the lost, Lord, would be convicted of their sins if they come and accept you as their Savior. Oh, God, I pray that you bless this church and this pastor. But most of all, Lord, we just pray that you'd be glorified and you'd be pleased. It would be a sweet-smelling savor before your throne. We ask it in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated tonight. This verse gives us a, sum a summation of a, a bit of information about Solomon that's rarely uh, spoken of. Solomon, we know, was the wisest man historically that ever walked the face of the earth. And the reason why, because when Solomon was crowned king of Israel, God spoke to Solomon and said, what would you have that I give to you? What do you want, Solomon? And Solomon very wisely said this, give me wisdom. Because the people are gonna come to me with all of their issues and all their problems. And I need to give them the right answer. Give me wisdom. And God granted his prayer and gave him not wealth. He didn't ask for wealth. He didn't ask for power. He didn't ask for overall peace, but he asked for wisdom. And because he asked for wisdom, God said back in those early chapters of 1 Kings, because you've asked for this, I shall grant you riches. I shall grant you power. I shall grant you peace because you asked for the right thing, Solomon. Solomon had some problems. Solomon had some issues. Solomon was wise, yes, but Solomon made some dumb, bonehead decisions. Look back in that first Kings where we told you to put your finger. Chapter number three. Now here's the history of the statement that we read in 2 Chronicles 8. First Kings chapter three, verse one. And Solomon made an affinity. That's kind of like a treaty or an agreement or an alliance, some sort of peaceful league, if you will. An affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord, and the wall of Jerusalem round about. Interesting. Solomon, a wise man. Now, turn a few pages over to chapter number 6, verse 37. Now, 
in this account in 1 Kings, we're reading about, uh, we're not going to read all of it, thank the Lord, but we're going to, you can find in these chapters, in these verses, how God directed David in the construction of the temple of God in Jerusalem, Solomon's temple, and you can go back and read at your time and study of all the, uh, 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 the architecture, the design, and the supply and the grandeur of Solomon's temple. Here we come to verse number 37. And in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month Ziph. That would be to us the month of May. And in the eleventh year of, this is Solomon's rule, eleventh year in the month Bull, that's to our month of November, according to scholars, which is the eighth month was the house finished. Throughout all the parts thereof and according to all the fashion of it, so was he seven years in building it. That's the house of the Lord. That's the temple of God. Now keep reading in one. But Solomon was building his own house 13 years. And he finished all his house. And he built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. And the length thereof was 100 cubits. The breadth thereof, 50 cubits. The height thereof, 30 cubits. Upon four rows, cedar pillars, cedar beams upon all the pillars. And it gives us all these uh, uh, construction details down through there. If you want a good little study, you could study uh, the construction of that temple. But let's read on down here. Look in verse number uh, uh, three where we left off. And it was covered with cedar upon the beams that lay on 45 pillars, 15 in a row. And there were windows in three rows. The light was against light in three ranks. What that means is there was light coming from all directions. All naturally, it was built in such a way where he had natural light lighting up his home. And all the doors and posts were square with the windows and the light was against light in three ranks. And he made a porch of pillars and the length thereof was 50 cubits and the breadth thereof 30 cubits. That's great little details. And the porch was before them and the other pillars and the thick beams were before them. Then, verse 7 and 8, look here now, look, watch this. Then he made a porch for the throne where he might judge, even the porch of judgment. And it was covered with cedar from one side of the floor to the other. And his house where he dwelt, now notice, where he dwelt had another court within the porch, which was of the like work. Solomon also made an house for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken to wife like unto this porch. Did you catch that? Solomon made an alliance with one of the worst enemies in the history, even unto this day, of the nation and the people of Israel when he made an alliance with Egypt. Egypt was the place of captivity and slavery of the Hebrews. Egypt is thick with prophecy in the Bible concerning Israel. And here's Solomon in all his wisdom. Early on in his reign, he makes a decision. That's foolish right off the bat. He made an affinity. He made an alliance. He made a, a peace treaty, if you will, with Egypt, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But in the deal, it wasn't a monetary exchange. But in order to make that harder to break out of, he married Pharaoh's daughter. Ah, ooh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. She's not a Hebrew, and she is not of the tribe of Judah, which was Solomon. He's breaking rule after rule in his first little stint as king. When he had prayed for wisdom, he marries Pharaoh's daughter. Ugh. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter, Solomon, Solomon, you're wise, and you're going to marry Pharaoh's daughter? Now, let's just be real. Within Israel, marriage was a lot different than it is now, okay? You know, I, I've got two girls. I'm not going to embarrass them tonight, but I don't have any boys. 
And I'm beginning to understand the practice in ancient times of arranged marriages <laughs> and dowries. I, I, I'm looking into that very seriously. And I think that's something that needs to come back around. I just have my own reasons, you know. <laughs> but each one of us, has experienced at some sort of range someone in our life who married the wrong person for the wrong reasons. I've got close family, very close family, who married at the wrong time for the wrong motivation, for the wrong reasons, and it brought nothing but heartache. And the consequences do not stop even if the marriage does. The consequences go on. The consequences reach through generations and they cause problems and they cause tensions and they cause all sorts of arrangements that have to be made just in order for folks to get along or not get along and never see each other. I have to talk. Do I get, can I get a witness in the house somewhere or another? Does anybody else have a stressful Thanksgiving dinner? Let me just say something to everybody who's unmarried. And no matter what age it is, it's good to teach them young, my friends. It's good to teach them young, Mama and Papa and Granny and G-Mama and Big Pop. Look here, teach them young. Marry the right one. Wait, wait, wait for the right one. Me and your mama will never put pressure on you to marry some jack leg just to get you out of our house. Oh, listen, it's important. We need to go back to looking at the Bible practices of man and wife coming together under the right reasons, under the godly direction. But Solomon, in all of his wisdom and his ways of discerning and finding out the truth and making the correct judgments under the, in, under the people of Israel, right off the bat, marries the wrong woman. What a mistake. Now we know that Solomon in chapter one of First Chronicles, we see how he comes to be king and he prays for wisdom. Chapter two, he begins this process of building the temple and in three and four, he goes on. In chapter five, he brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, into the temple. Chapter uh, 6, Solomon speaks in a, in a tremendous, we talked about uh, eloquent and powerful prayers in the Bible. One of the most powerful prayers in the Bible Solomon gives in those chapters. Dedicating the house of God, bringing in the Ark of the Covenant and setting it in order just as God directed. Chapter 7 God shows his approval of all that Solomon has done in building the temple and his glory falls and a cloud of God's Shekinah glory overtakes and the ministers, the priests come to a point where they have to turn their faces because of the glory of God that is so real and so palpable and so thick they cannot stand to be in the holy presence of God. Oh, Solomon's making some right moves. Solomon's making some right decisions. He's making some good things. He's following the Lord. And then in chapter 7 of 2 Chronicles, there's a very famous few passages of Scripture. And many times these verses are used as a catalyst for revival in a local church. Many of you could probably quote these verses. He says in the first several verses, verse 12, God speaks and appears to Solomon in chapter 7. And then chapter, four, uh, chapter 7, verse 14, there's those great revival verses. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Oh, we love that verse, don't we, amen? Don't we love that verse? Don't we use that verse for personal revival? Don't we pray that verse for church revival? Don't we use that verse as a means of motivating others to national revival? The church of the living God in these days needs a verse like that, oh yes. But in verses 19 through 20, 22, you never hear this preached. You never hear this preached. There is the great call and the, the methodology for revival. 
But then God, along with that, gives some consequences if they don't seek revival. If they don't follow what he says. Look at verse 19 of 7. He said, but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you and shall go and serve little g gods, other little g gods, and worship them, then I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land. He's talking about his own people. He said, if you forsake the laws that I've given, I appreciate the fact that you followed my direction, Solomon, on building this temple. But I'm here to tell you, the building is not enough. He said, if you go against and you turn back and you serve other gods, I will pluck you up out of this land. That's God. He said, when I have given them And this house which I have sanctified for my name will I cast out of my sight and will make it to be a proverb and a byword amongst all nations. He said, and this house which is high shall be an astonishment to everyone that passeth by it so that he shall say, why hath the Lord done this thus unto this land and unto this house? And it shall be answered, look at here in verse 22, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other little G gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he hath brought all this evil upon them. There is the call for revival. There is a great example of some people in authority leading the people into the right ways of doing what God has commanded and directed to the T. But there's a consequence, my friend, if we don't follow him. He goes so far in a prophetic way, and he could have said, I'm not correcting the Bible. We'll see later if you study your word on in the end of 2 Chronicles. It wasn't an if, it was just a matter of when. Because they did forsake God when other kings came along. And they did worship other little G gods. Is everybody listening tonight? Is everybody listening tonight? They forsook the God of heaven that brought them out of Egypt and gave them a place, gave them a promised land and gave them a law and he blessed them and he delivered them from their enemies. But they did forsake him and served other little G gods. How'd that happen? How did it come that at the end of 2 Corinthians, a man out of Persia named Nebuchadnezzar came in, marched through Judah, and and took and kidnapped tens of thousands of the brightest and the best young people of Israel and Judah and Jerusalem? How did that happen? Every big sin starts with a little sin. And we've heard it in business. Success rises and falls upon leaders and leadership. It rises and falls upon leadership. Well, what is the first thing that Solomon does in the very next chapter? (laughs) Verse 1 through 10. We're not going to read it. But he goes throughout the land and he sets up and he restores some towns that had been destroyed and he sets them up under tribute of the people of Israel and he rebuilds those towns and he sets them up as outposts and fortresses for his kingdom. But in verse 11, Pharaoh takes his wife I'm sorry, Solomon takes his wife, Pharaoh's daughter. And he builds her a whole separate house on the outskirts of town. With all of Israel watching. That doesn't seem wise to me. At all. He's setting up Historically, one of the enemies, he's got an end with the enemy and he's built her a house apart from his own palatial house by the temple. 
That's not wise. But that's what Solomon did. Hmm. Let me just say this. Now Israel was a kingdom and Solomon had a big job. And he had all these towns fixed up. And he had officers. And he had uh, 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 people who were in charge in, in kind of what we would call middle management. He had supervisory people throughout that land. And let me just, let's just be honest. There will never, there will never be a place on this earth where everyone lives, where everyone acts or performs or works or talks, or believes, or contributes, or turns out the same way. It's not going to happen until we get to heaven. And we're loosed from this old flesh, and we have a glorified body. Amen, I'm ready. Ah, that hurt, I need that glorified body. I've hurt myself this week, Brother Travis. Bang my toe with that thing last night, good night. That's going to hurt tomorrow, because I'm over 40. It don't hurt as bad right now. <laughs> It's not going to happen. Everybody's not always going to believe and do and act. and It's not going to happen. Forget it. Conformity and, unif and unification is one of the most extremely difficult things, even in a place of close proximity. It's just very difficult. We see that. Communism, socialism, monarchies, democracies, totalitarian dictatorships. Republics, they've all got laws, they've all got rules, but everybody don't act right still. Everybody still, you know, these socialists and these communists, they think that everybody's supposed to get everything all the same. It still doesn't happen that way. Why? Leadership is flawed. It's set up wrong. They're worshiping little g gods of the party and little g-gods of money, and little g-gods of power, and little g-gods of people, and little g-gods of possessions. And it was just as true in Solomon's day as it is now. But Solomon, in verse 11, he does something, and if you're going to title this in your notes, I would call it this. The danger of double standards. The danger of double standards. God gave his people rules and edicts and regulations and principles for them to live by, including as his chosen people, their practices of matrimony and marriage and children. Now, did they always follow that? No. Who was one of the chief? <laughs> Obliter I mean, he just obliterated it by a mile. The practices set up by God of marriage. Solomon. As wise as he was, one woman was not enough for him for some reason. You ever heard that phrase? Not my wife now, because I love my wife. You ever heard that phrase? I wouldn't take a million dollars for her. But I wouldn't give you two million for one just like her. You know that thing? I'm not that way myself. I mean, I just, you know, she's still looking at you. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't understand any folks out in Utah. <laughs> Brother Travis, I'm just carnal enough to know this right here. The, the Oak Ridge boys back in the 70s had a song when they went country. Trying to love two women is like a ball and chain. They used to sing gospel music now, but they knew something about that. You know what I'm talking about? That's terrible. Y'all don't cut that off of the thing. Don't all it. <laughs> y'all carnal enough. Y'all know that too. Bless all our hearts. But Solomon set a terrible example. And he opened up. It wasn't just a bad example, my friend. Look at me, young people. Look at me, all you young people. Look at me. He opened the door for a great possibility of extreme wickedness to come into his life. How did he do that? He just married somebody. Well, he married a pagan polytheistic woman. Now, she might have like, he might have like had some sort of little vetting ceremony and declared her now a naturalized Jew as his wife. <laughs> 
I, mm, I'm not a betting man, but I guarantee you when he hauled her out of Egypt, she had a wagon load of idols. Notice what he said in verse 11. My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel. Why? Because the places are holy. The places are holy whereinto the ark of the Lord hath come. Why would he not let her in there? He must have known some things about her that were unholy. Like all her little G gods that she brought up out of Egypt. But he still married her for all the wrong reasons. Brother Adam, you preaching about marriage tonight? Not particularly. See, Solomon, we see back in these earlier verses that we talked about in 1 Kings, Solomon not only had a problem with political alliances, he also had a problem with attraction. He never saw a woman he didn't love. If Bill Clinton could get away with it, Solomon could. Help me now. Help me. You got a bunch of people in this country that forget, turn a blind eye, and applaud for a philandering adulterer like he's some sort of God. And our country is eat up with wickedness and sin and the homosexual agenda and all kind of adultery and the breakdown and disintegration of the God-designed nuclear family of one man and one woman for one lifetime. Because Satan was at work then and Satan is at work now. And Solomon, he brought it to Israel. He brought it right to Jerusalem and parked it right outside of town for everybody to see. Doggone him. Why did he do that? Why did he have to have a thousand women Wives and concubines. Why? He might have been wise, but he had zero self-control. He wasn't that wise. He could discern the matters between others. He could solve the problems, the legal matters between two people who were at odds and bring great wisdom and people would stand there with their mouth open going, where does he get this kind of wisdom? But as he's banging his gavel, and a young lady walks through the courtroom. I'll be right back. Hit the music. Dum, dum, da, dum. And before sundown, he'd have another wife. Some of y'all don't let your kids say this. That was stupid. That's a level of stupidity in the wisest of people that is unprecedented. Even unto this day. Why would he do that? He had a problem with attraction. Let me tell you something. Grown folks, I'm not just going to pick on the kids tonight. I'm going to pick on some whatever you millennials are. I can't keep up with the generation X and generation Y and generation Z. And now the millennials and the generation raccoon. I have no idea what's coming next. Generation giraffe. I mean, good night. What are we doing? Look at me. Look at me. This world and the things you're looking at on your devices is telling you that you get to choose whether you're a boy or a girl. I know exactly where I am, by the way. Don't you worry about it. Let me tell you something. I've been pretty sweet this week. But I just want to inform you of something right here. When I stand right here, I represent the God of heaven and I'm not afraid of any person. I'm not intending to hurt your feelings, but somebody's got to say something. And somebody should have said something to Solomon. Nathan said something to David when David had Uriah killed so he could have Bathsheba. And Nathan came to him and stuck his finger in the face of the king and said, Thou art the man, David. And David said, I have sinned. I wonder if a, if a leather-lunged preacher of God's word in that time would have come to David out of that temple and said, David, this is a sin against God. You're breaking God's law. 
I wonder if it would have made a difference in Solomon's life. But obviously, as wise as he was, he didn't have a preacher with enough backbone to stop him from marrying a thousand women. 700 wives, I believe it is, 300 concubines. I guess they just didn't meet the wife level, you know. He had a problem with attraction. Let me tell you something. There is no temptation that's taking you that's not common unto man, but with the temptation, God will make a way of escape. There's a difference, my friends, between having a, a thought that passes through your mind and a thought that crosses over the line. It's not a sin. I said it earlier this week, I believe. It's not a sin to have a thought pass through your mind. It's a sin to let that thought linger and develop and turn into an attraction and turn into something that goes farther and deeper. Because lust, when it's conceived, brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Physical and spiritual. So he had a problem with attraction. He had a personal residence for Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, she was not holy enough for the house of King David. But she was okay to marry She's okay to keep around. She's probably good looking. Her daddy was rich. She's got a lot going for her. Everybody knows who she is. She's got like 7 million likes on Israel's social media. I mean, she sprays one of her Egyptians' perfume, and she gets like, I mean, paid, you know, from that perfume. I mean, she gets like 100,000 likes just for batting her eyeballs. Come on. That's who Pharaoh's daughter is. And she's got a little entourage with her. Egypt always came with an entourage. Think about it. Think about it. Pharaoh's daughter for Solomon was okay to marry. She was okay to keep around. He was okay to provide for her. He built her own house. And he made special arrangements for her. Hmm. Seems to me that Egypt produced several problems for the people of God over the years. My mind goes back to a fellow named Abraham who had a wife named Sarah. And for a period of time, they went down into Egypt. Hmm. A few years later, God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you and your wife a child. He said, God, I'm 99 years old. I think you've got the wrong fellow. Sarah, his wife, 98, 97 years old. She laughs out loud, L-O-L, -L, Sarah. And she says, well, now, Abraham, look, there is no conceivable, it's not humanly possible. Well, that's where she was right. But it was divinely possible. But no, Abraham, look, look, Abraham, look. I have to do this to you every time. Let me explain it. Here's what we're going to do. And Abraham went, uh-huh. <laughs> she said, Abraham, now look, I've got this, this young maid. Her name is Hagar. You remember, we picked her up while we were in Egypt. Hagar. I'm okay if you want to marry her and that way you have a child and we won't make God a liar. You remember Hagar? She came out of Egypt. Nice girl. Keeps good house. She's got a few little false idols, but I don't bother her about that. You know, she's from Egypt. Mm, sounds good to Abraham. Let's see. ISIS, Taliban. Hmm, still messing up with that today. 
Oh, and there was another guy. You know, there was another guy, you know, uh, Moses. He was in Egypt. His brother, Aaron, grew up in Egypt. Well, you remember when God delivered them, right? And they came out. Well, you remember when Moses, he went up into the mountain, received the commandments from God. You remember that? Well, they thought old Moses was dead because it was lightning, thunder, big old thick cloud up there. You remember all that? Well, where had all those people grown up? Egypt. Hmm. Seems like they learned some things in Egypt. They said, hey, Aaron, you're his brother. Let's do this. You remember when we were in, when we were in Egypt and they had all those animals, you know, that they worshipped and burned incense and danced around naked and drank and all that stuff? You remember that? Let's do that. You, we'll give you all our gold jewelry and you make us a golden calf. Where'd they learn that? Egypt. That didn't work out too well, did it? Aaron had two sons later on. God deals with all that, has to break it all down to him. I'm your God. You know what he did? You know what Moses did? He chopped that golden calf up, ground it into powder, put it into water, and he made them drink it. Read your Bible. But then God was merciful. He brought them into the wilderness, and he gave them the design and the instructions for the wilderness tabernacle, which was the predecessor to Solomon's temple. And Aaron was going to be the high priest who went in and he wore the, the linen ephod and he had the Urim and Thummim and he had the hat that was correct and he purified himself and they went through the sacrifices and they came down to it. Mm, over in Exodus 33, that first big day, sacrifices galore, God is showing up. They've done everything just to a T. But see, Aaron had two sons and they grew up in... Egypt, watching all that idol worship. What'd they do? They went and filled their censers. That was long posts, long, long rods that had a little, a little capsule on the end of it, and they would put burning incense in that, and they loaded that up outside of the direct instructions of God and they started waving that business around the temple of God, the tabernacle of God, just like they saw in. And God sent fire and consumed them on the spot because of what they picked up in Egypt. Solomon was wise. His mother taught him all these things. You don't believe that? Read the book of Proverbs. He's Lemuel. He's the one that wrote down Proverbs from all the things that his mother taught him. And she taught him the history of the children of Israel. He would have known about Abraham and Sarah. He would have known about Hagar. He would have known about Moses and Aaron. He would have known about Aaron's sons. And the first thing he does is pulls a little G idol worshiping Egyptian girl and marries her right off the bat. Prayed for wisdom. God must have just left a pinch out. I don't know. Where'd they pick all that up? From Egypt. Let me just make a statement right here. The church and the child of God better be very careful where they take their cues from. The church that looks like a nightclub is getting all their cues from Egypt. The church that's got a bunch of skinny jean, effeminate looking fellas up here. Put your hands together, everybody, for the Lord. Uh, bunch of harlots up singing. You can't sing the songs of holiness dress like a harlot and please God. Somebody's got to say it. Where are they getting their cues from? 
well, we've got this new music minister guy. He spent some time in L.A., and he picked up a lot of cool ideas. He worked for this production company. He's just revolutionized our whole worship experience. <laughs> I blacked out there for a minute. What happened? That was weird. Where are they getting their cues from? Stuff they saw over in Egypt. Stuff they saw over in New York and L.A. Stuff they saw down in Australia. Stuff they saw at places where they never preach against sin and never preach repentance for sin and salvation by grace through faith. I wonder where they got all that. They didn't get it from here. They could have taken an example from here. Because what happened? Because Solomon, oh listen folks. Mm. Solomon made a special place for his idol-worshiping bride. You know what he did? On Sundays, Wednesday night, and revival time, he came to church with all his church friends. Hey, guys, we're back. Hey, good to see you, brother. Hey, sister, pastor. Hey, everybody, brother so-and-so. Hey there, little buddy, how are you? God bless you, too. And then when he gets in the car, it's... And you baby, did you do it? Or it's on the back of my pickup truck with a cooler full of beer and my honey. <laughs> and you wonder why pastors have it so hard just keeping church people living right? You know why? Because they got a little bit of Egypt stuffed in their coat pocket. And they got a little Egypt stuffed in their back pocket. And they got a little bit of Egypt on their phone. And they got a little Egypt on their television at home. And they got plenty of Egypt in their closet where they put their clothes on. And they got a little bit of Egypt where they work when they're away from church. Well, I got my work friends and I got my church family. That's two separate groups of people, you know. I wonder how he acted when he went to her house. Because you know he never let her come over to his. I wonder how special that made her feel, by the way. I wonder how special that made Pharaoh's daughter feel. She never got to go into town like all the other wives and concubines. She never got to go to the big house. Now, she had a nice place. She was set up. She was what we would have called in the South a kept woman. A kept woman. He kept her over here. Because he recognized she does not need to come where the holy things of God are. Then Solomon, why do you keep her around? Because if she's not good enough for the best that God gives you, I'm sorry, you should have never married her. Hear what I'm saying right here. I'm not talking, look, I'm not, I'm not going to get into a bunch of like marriage and divorce stuff. We're not talking about that. I'm going to let Brother Travis preach pastor right there, okay? I'm not going to make a mess for you on that, brother. We're talking about sin that is kept to the side and is provided for and is kept in its place just when I get time for it. When I'm by myself. When she goes to sleep and I sneak downstairs. Or when mom and dad are gone to town and I've got it all to myself. Or when I go with those other friends and I can do what I want to do and they'll never know. And that's the wisest man that ever lived. You think you can match up with him? He's the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon. He had a problem. He said there are places that are holy 
But he had places where things that he kept that were not holy. Places like his radio. Places like his television. Places like his phone. And his laptop. And his iPad. And his closet. And her closet. And school and friends and hobbies and the beach and the swimming pool. I know I'm in Florida. I married a Florida girl. Y'all might remember a message I preached on Sunday night that said, be ye holy. I've seen a lot of signs going on beaches around the Gulf Coast. Don't leave your bottles, no cigarette butts, no battle objects, clean up your trash, no tents, after dusk, the holiness of God does not apply. I've never seen that on one of those beach signs. I've never seen the sign that says, all you Christians, it doesn't matter what you wear out here. This is the beach. Holiness doesn't count. This is a holiness-free zone. Y'all were liking me pretty good until about 7 o'clock. I'm not holding my family up to some kind of big, great example. We went to Gulf Shores back in July up in Alabama. Beautiful, white, sandy beaches. We hadn't been on a family vacation since Adeline was born. By ourselves. Like that. We've been to a bunch of revival meetings, and I try to do something fun, but that's not really vacation. You know what I'm talking about? But I'll tell you what, it's a funny thing. You get looked like, like you got a tail and like three horns coming out of your head if you wear clothes at the beach. Why has that dude got long pants on? Well, number one, I'm whiter than Casper the ghost, and I get sunburned real easy. <laughs> I'm like a trout. I'm speckled on top, white on the bottom. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Burn, peel, freckle. That's my cycle, you know? Why is he wearing a long sleeve fishing shirt? Why is his daughter's wearing all that long stuff in the water? Why is his wife wearing that long thing out? Hey, honey, come here. Yeah, I know you got less than your underwear on. It's okay. Y'all go play. Hello? Where did God say you can be holy, be holy everywhere but the beach and the swimming pool? Well, I'd start renaming that. Sandy Egypt. God's holiness does not, is not neutralized by saline or chlorinated water. Amen. 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 Why did these things happen? He's not, she's not Solomon's only wife. 700 wives, 300 concubines. Let me just say this. With sin, it's never just one thing. Sin never stops with one sin. Proverbs 30 tells about things that are never satisfied. The empty grave, an empty womb, different things that are never... Fire. Fire never stops till it burns everything up. And sin is the same way. One little sin turns into a thousand. Unless it's stopped. 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 I know this is not swinging from the chandeliers, camp meet, and everybody. Woo! But I wonder how many of our families and how many of our churches around this country would be in better shape if somebody said, Stop it. Stop it. Stop it, Solomon. Get Egypt out of here. Do not bring Egypt up in here. Do not marry that girl, Solomon. No. Do not bring her. Why? She was an idol worshiper. What, did I, what was Solomon's downfall? It's written in Scripture in Ezra and Nehemiah. Solomon, as wise as he was, his downfall was that he adopted the idol worship of all of his women. You think she was the first pagan that he married and the only one? 
he began to burn incense to false gods in the high places after he had built the temple to God. And because of that, Israel forgot God. What did God say in chapter 7? He said, if you forget me, I'll pluck you up out of this land. And in the latter parts of 2 Chronicles, Nebuchadnezzar came through after those Israelites had forgotten God, forsaken him, began to worship idols, and he took them into captivity for 70 years. And I wonder if Solomon had left that little old Egyptian gal alone, if any of that would have ever happened. Egypt coming into God's holy city. And Solomon, wise, but he had a problem. Nobody faced him up to it, and he never dealt with it. His daddy's problem was war. His daddy couldn't build the temple because he was a bloody man, and he was a man who always warred. Solomon was a man who always loved and lusted. And it cost his people, not just him. It led to idol worship. It led to captivity. I think about that little Egyptian gal. Nowhere in scripture do you ever hear her name. I wonder how special she felt. Funny thought. I wonder if he went around and kissed all thousand of them goodnight. Listerine is not enough, my friend. But he had them. A thousand. A thousand. A thousand. No, sir. How many of you girls would feel special if your husband had 999 just like you? But let me tell you this. That's hilarious, by the way. Let me tell you this. That's what Satan does. He makes you think you're special at first. But then you just become a number. You become a nameless, used up, lost face in the crowd. And there's old Solomon sitting up in the palace. Mm. There's a danger of double standards. And you think that, let me just tell you something. Brother Travis will attest to this. Brother Jason will attest to this. You never, as a preacher, whether you're an evangelist or a pastor, you never preach a message like this before the Holy Ghost has preached it to you 20 times and shown you Pharaoh's daughter. And he doesn't let it go nameless. He names it. God does. He names it. And I bet you, if you were honest, if you wanted to write it down on a piece of paper, some of y'all could name it. Because the Holy Ghost probably has named it to you right now. There's a danger in double standards. Brother Adam, we've had such a great revival. Yes, I know. And people have gotten saved. Hallelujah. I'm so glad of that. And I'll be honest with you, Brother Jason, I did not want to preach this tonight. This is the last night. I, I, you know, First impressions are one thing, but final impressions are another. But here's what I don't want you to ever walk away. If we never meet again this side of heaven, I don't want you to ever go back and say, boy, that brother Adam, he was a scaredy cat. He wouldn't preach what God told him to. I didn't want to preach this. Not one bit. But I have to. I have to. And if I have to, there's a reason. Let me tell you something, friends. We need to be holy. We need to pray. We need to have mercy. We need to call on the God of heaven and trust him. And we need to know his power and claim it as our own. But we cannot let sin go and expect God's blessings. It's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
But if you think that God is turning a blind eye and a deaf ear to your little Egypt, you're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. If you think God's okay with it, you got like mashed potatoes in your brains. If you think God, we used to sing an old song, Brother Travis, in one of the old hymn books, some of the old gospel groups used to sing. Nobody would sing it now because they'd never get booked anywhere. But we used to sing an old song back in North Alabama, way back in the country where all the rednecks live. By the way, proud redneck. That's a badge of honor for me. I, I, I take that as like a term of endearment. You sing this song. You can't do wrong and get by. And you can. You might fool people. You might fool your spouse. You might fool your kids. You might fool your parents. You might fool the preacher. But you're not fooling God. And Solomon might have made a grand statement. She's not to have a home because these are God's holy things. She will not come into the house of David where the holy things of God are. He probably had a good resounding big radio voice, you know. People just went, oh. sounds real good. All he's basically saying is, yeah, I got this little sin habit. I won't bring that in front of everybody. Y'all don't have to worry about it. I'll take care of it. It'll just be for me to deal with. And God dealt with it. Over time. He dealt with it. Let me tell you something, my friend. You will want to deal with it before God does. And there is no sin that God will not forgive except rejection of the Holy Ghost. You say no to God, you say no to Jesus Christ. But anything else, anything else, anything else, if a serial murder, and I know of one, son of Sam, David Berkowitz. Anybody remember son of Sam, David Berkowitz? All you, all you folks with little chrome. New Jersey, New York, killing spree. I have a friend from Jersey City, New Jersey named Richard Delfino, who was a hitman for the mob, cocaine addict, has no bones in his sinus cavity, he snorted so much cocaine, tried to kill himself, and he was shaking so bad from the drugs that a 38 busted out his front teeth, came out, pow, went through the wall. Listened to Gold City because he loved barbershop quartet music, and it reminded him of barbershop quartet music. Started coming to hear Gold City in the early 80s. Got gloriously saved and started ministering in the prisons. He said, I'm going to the people where I ought to be right now. And he made friends with David Berkowitz, whom God in prison gloriously saved. Amen. Serial killer. Monster. But you know what happened according to the testimony of those guys? I'm fixing to be done. Let me just tell you this. There's hope for anybody is what I'm trying to tell you. When Satan was through with him, when Satan had gotten all the good he had, when Satan had caused him to kill all those people and chop them up and just terrorize the nation, he'd tell you, he was demon-possessed. He had demons that would instruct him to do those wicked things. But when Satan was done with him, he dropped him in that prison. He was used up and through with him. But God didn't give up on him. Sent somebody in, witness to him. Holy Spirit convicted him. He accepted Jesus Christ, saved. Amen. There's no sin. Your secret little sin or the worst of the worst that God cannot and will not forgive because the blood of Jesus Christ Amen. cleanses every stain. The blood of Jesus Christ cleansed every sin, even Solomon's sin of an Egyptian bride. It took care of it all. 
and he can take care of it for you.